part of my talk, I want to put the state into the picture of economic development. And I want to focus there on the productive economy, on the positive side of the prosperity story. One that will align the US much more closely with state activist patterns of development than with the free market version. There's a second aspect of the US experience, not quite so positive, that gives a much broader relevance to the conference themes. And I'm thinking here of the F word, financialization. It's no secret that the seeds of the so-called global financial crisis and the Great Recession were sown in the US. And that the modern syndrome known as financialization, which has now been transmitted to uh, a whole um, series of economies, was also born in the United States. And that syndrome, I'm referring here to the increasing focus on banking and finance, on uh, to the uh, massive financial engineering that goes along with that, and to the business sector's singular preference for maximizing shareholder value. Issues I'll come back to. That pattern, that pathology, now appears to be turning against America's own long-term recovery, threatening the very basis of its techno-industrial power. And so in the second part of my talk, I will turn to recent trends in the financial economy that reveal this more negative development pattern, whereby production now serves finance rather than the other way around. And since that pattern has serious consequences for economic prosperity, for job creating growth, and income distribution, there are clearly wider implications of the US experience for other countries. Uh, back to that later. It would be remiss of me not to mention that my talk draws on the argument of my new book. You can hold that up if you like, Penny. <laughs> in which I explain why it is that the United States, above and beyond all <coughs> others, uh, why it is the US that has created the world's most powerful, most formidable innovation engine the world has ever seen. For half a century and more, the US has been the uncontested high-tech hegemon, leading the world in virtually all the major technologies that drive the modern economy and underpin its prosperity. Think uh, communication satellites, think uh, software and computing and biotech and the internet, and the list goes on. But why the United States leads, why the US became um, a formidable techno leader, is a question rarely posed and least of all, well understood. A popular view, uh, and not just popular, but also a fairly scholarly view, would have it that America leads because it has freer markets that produce a risk-taking culture of entrepreneurship. And Silicon Valley always looms large in this context. My research turns this idea on its head. America leads because its entrepreneurial class has a risk-taking state. In other words, US leadership in advanced technology <coughs> is not the result of freer markets or more risk-taking entrepreneurs or even industry policy, all the usual suspects. It is instead the creation of a national security state that has institutionalized technological supremacy as a national security imperative as a strategic response to a series of perceived geopolitical threats sustained, which have been sustained over a very long period that began with the onset of the Cold War and has continued right up until 9-11 and beyond. And uh, it's this geopolitical imperative that gives the national security state, the NSS, I know that means something else here, uh, it gives that NSS a risk appetite that is way beyond anything the private sector is prepared to sustain, and a risk appetite that accounts for why it's prepared to pour vast resources into long-term projects that are especially conducive to fostering this radical, transformative kind of innovation. And I go on to conclude that the NSS innovation engine and the substantial benefits that it produces for the American economy is increasingly threatened not by defence spending and military R&D, as some have argued, but by financialisation. 
um, which has created, as I'll show, a severe disconnect between innovation and production, driving production offshore, denuding the industrial ecosystem that brings ideas to market, and contributing to jobless growth and rising income inequality. But before I plunge into that side of the story, let me unpack this argument beginning with the productive economy and the positive side of the story of how the US rose to become the world's techno hegemon. The first point uh, I want to make is that America's innovation engine wouldn't exist without its key driver, the NSS. In order to cope with the Cold War and pursue its grand strategy of achieving technological superiority over any potential rival, the US built a national security state, by which I mean a collection of federal agencies and national laboratories which have national security missions and which concentrate responsibility for science and technology. It's this cluster of agencies and national labs that are centered around defense, space, energy, science, and health, that is the NIH, National Institutes of Health there, um, that is the major source of America's unusual capacity for um, transformative innovation. But the mission agencies have also steadily become more active in the commercial arena, often assuming business and entrepreneurial functions. Um, a glance at the ne next slide, well, you know, hard to, there's a lot of stuff to get through there, but I'm just putting that up to indicate I'm not making this stuff up, it's all in the book. Um, but a quick glance at this slide gives you an activist picture of, um, of what this state is doing. Far from simply funding R&D in some kind of passive sense, uh, these mission agencies are taking equity stakes, stakes in private companies with relevant technologies that they want to influence. For example, the CIA's venture capital fund, InQtel, has a portfolio of some 150 young companies. And often, when it sells off, a, after it's got the technology and sells off a company, uh, a, a, a company like Apple or Google will come along and take that company and uh, work it up into its own business model. Um, these mission agencies are also partnering with private firms and universities as well as their own labs uh, to produce advanced products for both government and commercial markets. They sponsor the transformation of innovation into products for the market. Um, for example, the Department of Energy's nuclear laboratories, Sandia, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, they um, run entrepreneurship courses for their scientists and they help these scientists to fund startups with innovations from their own labs, um, and so on and so forth. And so what these, um, in, in addition to all of that, um, they're providing, these mission agencies are providing a market for innovations through government demand. And last but not least, they devise the all important problem sets for industry to work with. Problem sets that call forth innovations that don't yet exist. Uh, the sorts of problem sets that uh, produce everything from the internet to computer simulation to 3D graphics to gizmos like Siri. Uh, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you'll know what Siri is. It's that personal assistant um, that's supposed to be intelligent. And it's the result of a DARPA instruction to Stanford Research Institute to come up with a personal assistant that could respond to instructions, reason and reflect on its experience, and basically act like a soldier's assistant. This is the Callo project from the Latin soldier, uh, Latin soldier's servant, and Siri is the result, a very small result. There have been many others, and that's been acquired by Apple. So this NSS led innovation system now reaches into the furthest corners of the commercial sector, of the private commercial sector. Even the latest innovations being attributed to Google, for example, the driverless car came directly out of the National Security Project, and we'll see more of that one of these days soon. The second point I want to make is that geopolitics, not industry policy, is the main driver behind this enormous technology enterprise not aimed at competitiveness, but the motivating force is the perception of sustained 
uh, threats to national security. This whole NSS enterprise had its beginnings at the onset of the Cold War when planners in the Pentagon announced that they could never hope to match the Soviets with um, sheer quantity of armaments, of men and material. Instead, they said, they'd have to rely on achieving technological superiority over any potential rival. And that strategic imperative has driven federal governments to embrace both universities and industry as partners early on in this enterprise and has led government to create technology intensive agencies like DARPA and NASA with a mission to prevent what's called technological <coughs> surprise. Surprise of the kind that was generated with, uh, by Russia's launch of Sputnik, the world's first satellite in 1958. So it's rivalry with the Soviet Union and the fear of being left behind in the innovation stakes that's helped kickstart a whole uh, gamut of, of programs, um, including a program in 1958 to create a modern venture capital industry to spur innovation, which as late as 1984, this program, when Silicon Valley was already in full swing, still provided three quarters of all venture capital in the United States. And so what I'm saying is that national security lies at the origins, not just of the modern venture capital industry, it's the missing link in that story, but it also lies at the origins of America's post-war development more generally. Um, and some have leapt to the conclusion that the US is thereby preaching free market ideology while actually doing industry policy beneath the radar. But uh, it's worth pointing out that anti-statism is so strongly embedded as political ethos and institution in the American political economy that any program that smacks of industry support is strongly opposed, um, certainly by Congress and more broadly than that, and invariably short-lived. And in any case, the NSS has reoriented its tech programs in a quite openly commercial direction since the 1980s. That's a complex story. Um, but one important catalyst has been the defection, the defection of the country's most advanced technology suppliers from the government market to the more profitable commercial markets. And that defection has created alarm and it, it often occurs. Um, the point being that if the NSS wants to ensure supremacy in the technological arena, which is so essential to its grand strategy, um, then it has to make the incentives sufficiently rewarding to attract and retain those advanced suppliers to work on its projects, which, by the way, are not part of that traditional military-industrial complex, which I'm sure you've already worked out. And so its technology programs have increasingly offered the incentive of a commercial product at the end of the government contract by emphasising dual use. So for instance, if a firm works with an agency to create a technology for use by the Army, say, or by the Department of Energy, um, it will also be encouraged from the outset of that project to create a similar project product for the um, commercial market. And in that way, and many, many more, which I discuss in the book, the NSS has been increasingly drawn into uh, promoting commercial innovation. So, when discussing America's productive economy, including Silicon Valley and its many IT giants, we have to factor in the past and the present role of the NSS. Without the geopolitical stimulus, without the national security logic, and the quest for technological superiority, the US innovation engine would not exist in its present form the US would not have the risk appetite that produces transformative innovation. It would be just like any other advanced country, which is not to say that it's the only kind of innovation that matters to economic development, or indeed to advocate a national security state as the driver of innovation. Uh, heaven forbid, it has its own costs and distortions. But rather to indicate that the US is distinctive not because its productive economy has freer markets or more freewheeling entrepreneurs or even more inventive entrepreneurs, but rather because it has a highly active, highly motivated, risk-taking state. 
So, I want to now change gear and turn to the financial side of the story. US power, I suggest, has reached a turning point. And the problem that I want to draw attention to is the disconnect between innovation and production that has taken place as a result of financialization. And that's a disconnect whose, broader, whose impacts have broader lessons. One of my conclusions is that the greatest threat to the US innovation engine comes not from a high level of spending on defense or on military R&D, as some have suggested, but from a particular wholly modern form of financialization. This is the financialization of the US corporation, not just the US corporation, but in this story it is. Um, it is an all-American invention, and it promotes and rewards uh, ma the maximizing of shareholder value, MSV, it's called sometimes for short, um, as the supreme goal of the American company. We say the corporation has become financialized when its primary goal is no longer to invest in productive assets like innovation or R&D or new and improved products, but instead when it focuses on ways and means to maximize its share price. And this has become an enormous issue. The most recent manifestation of the US mania for MSV has been brought to light with startling clarity by former Harvard professor Bill Lazonic. Um, he documents how companies are pouring their profits into share buybacks in the trillions of dollars, a trend that has really taken off in the last decade. But there's an earlier trend, and it's closely connected to this buyback mania that began sometime in the 1980s, also when public policies became supportive in various ways. And this trend continues right up to the present, and this is the company's downsize and distribute strategy, um, which is to say that the pressure to maximize shareholder value drives the business sector to downsize, to reduce its workforce, and to distribute, outsource its production to suppliers in foreign locations. This is the so-called offshoring of production, which all of us know about here. One indicator of this offshoring trend is the state of US business investment abroad. No, sorry, at home. Uh, now ranked lower than in every other advanced country, just ahead of uh, Burma at 135th position, um, according to CIA data. Another indicator is the state of US employment with severe consequences for, for income distribution. Uh, for example, Foxconn, the Taiwanese um, computer and mobile phone manufacturer, which figures prominently in the US supply chain, now employs more people in China than Apple, Dell, Microsoft, Cisco, Intel, and Hewlett Packard combined employ in the United States. So, in a typical move, a company, say Hewlett Packard, will retrench its manufacturing workforce, and with the funds released, it will buy back its own stock, which then drives up the share price somehow or other, I don't quite know how that works, but the top management executives whose remuneration is linked to the share price will then receive bonuses and or uh, cash in their stock options, and the company finally will outsource production its production needs to foreign uh, suppliers. Okay, so yes, we know firms in all advanced countries uh, offshore some of their production to take advantage of global value chains. It's a huge literature on that. The point is that US companies have been the strongest practitioners of downsizing the labor force and distributing production to suppliers in foreign parts of the world, <coughs> and not coincidentally, they've been the strongest enthusiasts for ma maximizing shareholder value, uh, an ideology apparently <coughs> invented by a Harvard um, business school guru. The upshot is that US companies have increasingly abandoned manufacturing, um, to the point where the White House recently has been 
trying to, has been sitting up, taking notice and launching a whole series of initiatives uh, with uh, pretty poor support from Congress, uh, Republican dominated Congress, um, initiatives to try and uh, bring about a renaissance of American manufacturing, particularly advanced, with an emphasis on advanced manufacturing, of course. Apart from that, one could press the point further by making the comparative point uh, that US corporations have engaged in a form of extreme offshoring. Extreme in the sense that they've taken this D&D strategy further so that the size of the US um, of America's manufacturing industry is now very much smaller than in most other jurisdictions. Apple, as we know, is a leading exponent of this um, modular or distributed manufacturing model. Well, we often hear the globalization made me do it claim, the contention that companies are forced to send production offshore in order to remain competitive and that the continuing uh, shrinkage of manufacturing um, in advanced countries is a normal and unavoidable outcome of globalized markets. But if the US pattern is not the norm, if it lies at the extreme end of the spectrum, if many other equally advanced countries still retain significant manufacturing sectors, especially advanced manufacturing, then this would indicate something more is at work than the no choice constraints of globalization. And that something more, I suggest, is, financial, is pressure from US financial institutions for which there's mounting evidence, a pressure that's exerted even at the startup phase so that as Intel's former CEO, uh, and Andy Grove, comments or reports, a key question that the US venture capitalist typically puts to the uh, startup entrepreneur is, what's your China strategy? Meaning, what plan do you have in place to send jobs to China? And that's just at the startup phase. So the US then is the extreme case of manufacturing exit compared with other advanced economies. Okay, the British pattern looks similar, but much more long-standing and is arguably connected to an older form of financialization, of financialism, in which promoting the city's interests also serve Britain's great power status. Well, I find it telling that in both these cases where the shrinkage has gone furthest, governments now are acknowledging that there is a problem that needs remedying. And, uh, and so you get, as well as Obama's initiatives, you get um, Brit the British government's uh, major foresight report coming out last year, which is setting out in some detail how and why Britain needs to start growing its advanced manufacturing base if it wants to grow employment and improve its standard of living. So what, we may ask. I emphasize the offshoring trend because financialization is driving it further and faster in the US than anywhere else and because the disconnect between innovation and production that it's bringing about tells us something about the broader impacts on the productive economy that carry lessons for all. Because when production disappears, because when production uh, disappears, um, it appears that other things decline as well. One is the capacity for innovation, as I've indicated. Another is job creating uh, growth, which is key to a more equitable income distribution, and thirdly, an ability to weather economic crisis. On the first of these, innovation, uh, we see a number of studies in the US coming out of MIT, for example, most recently, concluding that the, the dearth of manufacturing is creating black holes in the US economy, um, referring here to the dense production networks that are necessary for innovations to be prototyped and scaled up. And these networks, uh, they're disappearing. And the same report concludes that when there's little left of this industrial ecosystem of suppliers and manufacturers and equipment makers to bring new ideas to market, innovation is also seriously weakened. But beyond that, beyond innovation, disappearing production has an impact um, on job creating growth because manufacturing has what economists refer to as the, as a, um, the, the greatest multiplier effect. 
Um, in fact, they calculate that the advanced manufacturing sector makes the largest contribution to job creation of any sector. For every production job, somewhere between another three and 15 are created. And a closely related point made by that British Foresight report that I referred to is that advanced manufacturing involves much more than production, since it's an integrated set of activities in which production lies at the very centre of an extended value chain. And so if you take production out of that, the value chain collapses, and along with that, um, the jobs that attach to it cannot exist. A final effect of declining production that I want to mention, one that would repay much more systematic comparative research, is the idea that a healthy manufacturing base provides a shock absorber against economic crisis. Countries with healthy manufacturing sectors, notably those which have reined in financial excess, uh, uh, Korea, Japan, Germany, Sweden, for instance, all bounce back relatively quickly as um, demand for their output recovered at home and abroad. And not least because their financial institutions have been better regulated to serve the productive economy rather than being allowed to become its freewheeling master. So, uh, to just um, conclude, um, I think that telling the US story of transformative innovation confirms the more general point that's been advanced in a series of studies, namely that the state remains a vital actor in helping to shift the economy up the development ladder. And that's a principle that applies every bit as much to the world's most advanced political economy in spite of its foundational narrative. In addition, the story makes clear that even the most avant-garde R&D and innovation doesn't consistent, consistently translate into broader economic benefits if the disconnect from production is taken to an extreme, as is the case in the United States. So if there are morals to this story, um, one would be that market forces alone cannot bring production back. Only a concerted government effort can rejig the incentives to rebalance the productive and financial economies, which are now in massive asymmetry. There's no magic bullet for the job creating growth, for, for the job creating growth needed to reduce income inequality, but a country that favours the financial sector at the expense of production is very likely building its future on sand. But I'll just leave you with a quote from the IMF chief, former IMF chief economist, Simon Johnson, who's written brilliant stuff on the financial crisis. He says, the rise of China, this is about the US of course, the rise of China does not necessarily imply slowdown or demise for the United States, but if they specialize in making things, and we specialise in finance, they will eat our lunch. So thank you.